All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this live session on social gastronomy as part of the activities of the fourth edition of the Food and Climate Shapers Digital Bootcamp hosted by the Future Food Institute and FAO. This session will be hosted by our dear partners at the Social Gastronomy Movement, and our speakers are Nicola Grixka and Professor Joh Johanna mendelssohn Foreman. Uh, just a quick introduction, uh, Nicola is the co-founder and leader of the Social Gastronomy Movement, which is a global network of interconnected local communities that use the power of food as a tool for social change. She is a social and systems entrepreneur, a food activist, and a change maker who is actively engaged in coaching young women and social entrepreneurs around the world. I would also like to mention that Nicola is also an adult of this bootcamp, whereby she was a participant during the third edition. And Professor Porn is a founding member of the Social Gastronomy Movement. She's an advisor and co-founder of the Social Gastronomy Movement Education Network. She's also an adjunct professor at the American University School of International Service and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center heading the food security program. She has frontline experience as a policymaker on conflict and stabilization, which drives her interest in connecting the role of food in conflict, which led her to create her organization, The Conflict Cuisine. Uh, of course, they will, I will give them the floor further to introduce themselves and the social gastronomy movement. I would like to welcome them both. Thank you very much for joining us. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Nikki, over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Ruba, and uh, so nice seeing everyone. As Ruba said, I was a climate and food shaper myself, which was an exciting time. And I know that there are free social gastronomy movement members actually in the room as well. Um, so big shout outs to you ladies, Laura, Clara, and Nora. Um, and yeah, we're super excited to be here today. I'm like Ruba said, um, one of the co-founders of the social gastronomy movement. Um, and you will hear a little bit more about the movement throughout the presentation as well. So I'm not gonna jump the ship, but um, I'm originally Polish and um, sort of found myself through food because I had to leave the country when I was very young and lived in more than 10 countries ever since. So it was a constant reinvention and trying to find my identity, my sense of belonging and my story. So that, you know, pride as well on my roots. And eventually I found that in the sum of recipes of my ancestors, of my grandmother, uh, my mom. And so that's where I started as well. The moment that I receive and host people, I always share our traditional dishes um, and, and recipes just because I gained this pride. And um, so that's why I made it my vocation eventually as well. And um, yeah, super excited to be here to share that passion that um, I personally have for, for food that can really change the world in my opinion, as it plays this very central role in all our lives. And uh, with no further ado, I, as we were with Social Gastronomy Movement invited to, um, to hold a class with you guys. Uh, I had to invite Johanna to join us um, as she was actually one of the first co-creators of the education network as well. And with no further ado, I'll hand over to Johanna to make an, a little introduction of herself. Well, thank you, Nikki. And thank you, Ruba. And thank you to everybody at the uh, food future, future Food Institute. It's a tongue twister. Um, it's actually afternoon here. I'm in Washington, D.C. And like Nikki, I'm fascinated by the intersection of food and world affairs. And Nikki is actually the person who taught me the word social gastronomy. And I still remember the day, it was a hot summer day. And you said the word as you were going to the Inter-American Development Bank, we were going to a meeting. And I said, why that is an incredible way to talk about food as a tool for social change. And it really got me thinking because my work started dealing with countries in conflict, especially after the Cold War ended, when so many countries moved into conflict because of the lack of proxies from the United States or the former Soviet Union. Um, and like Nikki, I have my own passion around food. Uh, I grew up in the United States, but my grandmother came from Poland. My other ancestors came from Austria. Um, I know and still love to cook and eat. So. I think every one of you who's sitting here, and I think it's six in the evening uh, in Europe, uh, must like it and we're interfering with your dinner. So you must really be passionate about this subject. Uh, since Ruba did a very nice introduction, um, I don't need to tell you any more, Nikki. I think we should go ahead and start the slides. Fantastic. Um, bear with me as I'm 
going through technology here. Oh, that's where it always. Which slideshow? Okay. There we go. Hold on, where is that present? Ah, there we go. Yeah, slideshow. <laughs> All right, this is working out really well. Seriously, it worked before. Where do I have to click? It's uh, You can click at the bottom. On ah, your here we go. <laughs> All right, so I'm really good with food, but I'm really bad with technology. Nice meeting you all. So you've met us. And actually, as we are kicking this off, we want to hear from you as well. And so we're going to start with a little question. What does social gastronomy mean to you? First of all, you have your chat option, write what social gastronomy means to you. And at the same time, we're also um, sending out a poll right now that we'd love for you to, um, to fill out. It shouldn't take more than basically free clicks. <laughs> so um, if you ladies could, Ruba, if you could share in the chat for people to fill out the, um, there we go, perfect. So the poll is going through Menti. So if you can just enter um, with the code, fantastic, there we go, with the code and just answer the two questions that we put forward in the poll. Perfect. Is that working for everyone? No. Mm. Ruba, I'm dependent on you here. <laughs> yes, did everyone manage to enter? Or is anyone having any issues? Questions aren't popping up. So when I click on the link, it just brings you to a yeah. page where there's yeah, like a little I, heart I you dialed, can click. I, yes, you will click on, I, you I, need to I click on the dialed in, guys, but I dialed in, but I can't seem to zoom in. Yeah, so I, I clicked on the heart and then nothing happens. And then if you click the picture, it just gives like a zoomed in view of the picture. If ever we can, we can just do it, you know, <laughs> we, we always have technology problems. We just had our own <laughs> webinar before. So why don't we hear from, from people um, if anyone wants to speak up and um, maybe, you know, like write in the chat as well. Have you heard the term social gastronomy? That would be the first question. And the second, second question, what does it mean to you, social gastronomy? So for those that want to just speak up, just unmute and, and, and share with us. And otherwise, we will be looking at the chat now. To collect, to collect that. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Whoever wants to answer, you can either speak up or send your answer in the chat. Okay. We have Nicola. I don't really know the term. Maybe an inclusive gastronomy. Inclusive gastronomy. Mm -hmm. I have Don't personally, um, right here. <laughs> yes, no, yeah. no. Oh, um, I've never really heard of social gastronomy, so I'm quite curious on um, what's it about. Anybody else? There's Amber, who's I've never heard the term before, but upon first thought, I think it means responsible production and consumption of delicious food. Uh, Joy is biased. <laughs> she learned about uh, social gastronomy many years from, uh, ago from me. Social gast Roberta, social gastronomy to me is maybe preparing food considering ethics and social impact. <laughs> I like the next one. I've never heard of the term social gastronomy, but I think it has to do with food for your stomach. <laughs> The gastro, fair enough. <laughs> Clara, agent of change. <laughs> She's biased too. Mm -hmm. Addressing social issues for food systems. A network to help people from the gastronomy perspective. Taste. <laughs> Maybe something to do with food and the impact relation it has on social issues. 
All right. Johanna, I think with that, I, I, I feel that the group has not heard too much. If we were to see the poll, I would guess like 80% have not heard the term of social gastronomy and 10 have somewhat an idea what it is and 10 actually are involved with social gastronomy. Well, maybe by the end of this hour, we'll be able to have everybody well-versed and educated and joining along in their countries uh, to do more. And they'll even discover they're practicing social gastronomy. So why don't you go ahead, Nikki, and uh, start the overview, and then I'll do a little bit of the background. Perfect. If the slides were moving, I would do it. There we go. Social gastronomy. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So social gastronomy uses the power of food to respond to modern challenges and generate social change. That is the definition that you've given it. Joanna, if you want to elaborate from an academic perspective. So I think that's right. One of my students calls social gastronomy food social work, uh, using food as a tool to create change or to empower people. But essentially, because food is all about power and everybody needs it to survive, uh, this is a concept which has evolved and evolved over time. Uh, I give credit to the Nordic food movement that started at the beginning of this century looking at the important ways that food had an impact on society, had an impact on nature, had an impact on the world in which we all live. But let's move forward so you can learn a little bit more. Perfect. So we have a few numbers that we wanted to share because the SOFI report just came out um, with new numbers that aren't unknown numbers for the world. And when we talk about social issues, Obviously, we need to address um, um, the inadequate access to food. So nearly one in three people in the world did not have access to adequate food. And it increased to almost 320 million people just in one year when we look at the COVID situation. And when we look at children, we have stunted children, 20, 22%, 6.7% wasted and 5.7% are overweight. So there's really the double burden of malnutrition. And all of this that we're talking about is in the context of the sustainable development goals, because food, as you know, could actually address each and every single one of the sustainable development goals. And um, Johanna, I'm gonna hand over to you for the following, giving a little bit of more context setting uh, for social gastronomy. Great. And just let me focus on goal number two, which is zero hunger by 2030. And one of the things we'll talk about going forward is how much more difficult things have become to achieve that goal after a lot of progress at the beginning of this century. So if you wanna move the slide to the next one, Nikki. Um, I hope today we can talk about the three C's of food insecurity. Uh, these, SOFI, which is a nice nickname for the State of Food Insecurity Report that was issued um, this spring, talks about three major inputs to food insecurity. Climate change, which we all know, global conflict, which we may know some about because we know the results of conflict, refugees coming into Europe, refugees coming away from their countries, people being trapped in communities, and now, of course, a global pandemic, COVID-19. And the number of food insecure people has gotten worse in about 55 countries, according to Sophie. Uh, Nikki put the slide up and the increase is amazing. And that's because food insecurity is not only lack of access, but the UN figured that it costs about $3.20 a day, so that's probably about 2 euro 80, in order to feed someone adequate nutrition. That's a lot of money if you have no income or if you are living in a rural area and you can't farm. So one of the other stunning facts is that most of the food insecure people actually come from the African continent. I wanted to go to this report because I think if you haven't seen it, it's worth taking a look. You know, the United Nations publishes something called the Human Development Report every year. 
And in 2020, which the report comes out at the beginning of 2021, but it's called The Next Frontier, Human Development in the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is as complicated as social gastronomy <laughs> is a term, because the Anthropocene really is about a factor that is very real. We are living in an age when we are responsible for the shifts in temperature, humans, human beings, men and women, and thus we're responsible for the consequences that are resulting in a hotter and hungrier planet. Now, those of you who are living in Europe are aware of what's going on with severe flooding and damages. Here in the United States, we've had a terrible heat wave in a part of the country that's never had a heat dome before. We've had ongoing fires. This is all life in the Anthropocene. This is a geological era that is replacing the Holocene, which is what we were living in before. And it's quite a remarkable shift in the way we're living. So let's go on to the next slide. So we know about the pressures on the earth. Uh, for the last 12,000 years, we have been able to survive with changes and there certainly have been fluctuations in climate over 12,000 years. But this new age, this new geological age really threatens development. Uh, we are endangering our own future if we don't link climate with the consumption of food and now of course the effect of climate on raising, rising temperatures and pandemics. And the most dr dramatic thing we see is global inequality. We've always known there's been inequality between richest countries and poor countries. But in fact, the richest countries are no longer immune from this change, nor are they able to manage it. And I think that is one of the more stunning features of this life in the Anthropocene. And what's fascinating is that while world, the low income countries are getting extreme heat, 100 days versus 18 days in the past, the rich countries are getting the same kind of problem and not having the adequate preparedness to deal with it. Next slide. So this, this definition, and I just want you to take a look at it, is interesting for two reasons. In 1996, there was a World Food Summit. I'm sure you're all aware that in September of this year, there'll be another UN World Food Summit. But 1996 was the last time there was a global meeting about food alone. I mean, it's been discussed in the climate and the COP, but this is the definition, which is still the working definition of food security. It deals with having access at, to food that's safe and nutritious and meets dietary needs. Well, it's a good compromise definition, but we know from the results of the last years that we have not met this definition. So next slide. And you know, 118 million people are living in, have more hunger in 2020 than they did in 2019. Uh, this is dramatic and this is, an actual consequence, not only of climate, but a consequence of the COVID pandemic. Because climate change not only affects zoonotic diseases like pandemics, but people have been moving. The world has been moving. People no longer stay in the same place because their farmland has become drier. They have nothing to farm. And so we have a real problem of climate migration that according to experts who look at this say is not going to end. It's certainly not going to end in my lifetime. And we need tremendous effort to curtail migration based on climate, not based on human rights violation, but based on climate, but also because people are moving away from these zones. Next slide. So Agnes Kalabata, I'm sure many of you have heard of her. She is the special envoy for food systems. She's a Rwandan woman. And um, she says something very interesting in this quote, that hunger is a symptom of COVID-19. It's not that the system, COVID created the hunger, but we have a globally dysfunctional system. And we can talk about this later in the questions and answers. Think about in your own country, in your own experience, why it's dysfunctional. So food waste, one of the greatest problems we face in the world is food waste. 
The developing country faces it in what we throw out. Approximately 1.3 billion tons get wasted. This is from the Food and Agricultural Organization, not my number. And if you look at the per capita food losses and waste, it's pretty impressive how the waste increases, especially in the developing world. Now, waste in the, de the developed world, waste in the developing world is often an inability to harvest or to get post-harvest loss under control. But regardless, I love this statistic, which is that if food waste or, you know, which goes into landfills were a country, it would be the third largest climate carbon emitter after China and the United States. So just think of landfills in your own country. And that is a really interesting and challenge that people can do something about. And Nikki and I will talk later about what kinds of actions we can take. Next slide. So the other issue about conflict is that food and conflict are very related. The, there are the 1,815 million food insecure people live, half of them live in, more than half of them live in countries by in, in, affected by conflict. So th that number of 489 million is not exactly right because the number changes every day, but conflict is a driver of hunger. And what has always impressed me, and we can go to the next slide, is that conflict does create food crises. If you just take a look at this slide, the top row, the green row is about normal food cycles. People plant in the spring, you get your rain and crops grow, you harvest in the fall and you have food for the winter. But what happens during a war? Well, if you have violence, people start can't plant, they can't, have anything for the rain to support. There's no harvest in the fall. And by winter, the food runs out. And this is what happened in Syria. This is what's happened in many countries that are under conflict, but it is very much related to the inability to plant food in a crisis environment. Let's move to the next slide. So I just wanted to show you the other issue, which is that hunger and food instability are very much connected. So when we talk about the number of people that have become hungrier over the last few years, it's a relationship between these drivers, which are poor governance, grievance, economic greed, extreme weather is only one of them, market failures, and resource competition. So it's a vicious cycle. And it is an important thing to understand when you're trying to analyze in your own communities how food leads to instability. So let's go to the next slide. And this slide, which was done in 2020 at the end of the year, these are the worst food crisis. This was done in 2020, it was in 2019. Um, it lists the following crises, starting with Yemen, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Ethiopia, South Sudan. Uh, after South Sudan, it's uh, Syria, then uh, Northern Nigeria and Haiti. So actually the Democratic Republic of Congo has moved up to number one and Haiti will probably move up after this crisis. And that's really important to know also. Uh, I should also mention one other factor and that is in since 2015, where there was progress and very steady progress being made to end food insecurity. Today, that progress has been reversed. And each year, more and more people go hungry. So one of the questions before the United Nations Food Security System Summit is how do we get back on track so that by 2030, the zero hunger goal is close to met? So I'm just gonna say a few words in the next slide about soft power, another term, if you don't know it, we'll introduce. So at the beginning, Nikki had a slide about food as power and what is soft power. Well, 
the academic definition is, of course, that you have hard power, which is the use of force and guns and warfare. But soft power is what people do to engage, what nations do, and also people do to engage people. So culinary diplomacy, nation branding, gastro diplomacy, and social gastronomy are all forms of soft power. These are tools both that diplomats and citizens have in their toolkit to promote food as a tool for building peace and more stability. And I think this is an interesting way to think about social gastronomy if you're a political scientist is to say, yes, this is one more way in which we can use food as a tool to help refugees, to help those who are excluded, those who have no equality, to help gender equality and go and furthermore. So I'm gonna turn this very academic program over to Nikki, uh, who's gonna tell you how the social gastronomy movement can impact this kind of change. Thank you so much, Johanna. And um, for those that wanna learn more, because today we're only gonna talk about the last soft power of social gastronomy. Right. But as Johanna mentioned, there are many more forums. So I would really encourage to actually, Johanna has given some great talks on all of these topics. And culinary diplomacy was the one that uh, we connected on specifically as well. Um, great. So. Again, I wrote, and I'm having trouble with these slides. I'm like sweating. I'm sorry, guys, but we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> so um, after a little bit of a context and how social gastronomy comes into play, and we will get to more tangible examples, I wanted to give a quick introduction to the uh, social gastronomy movement, actually, that um, basically came to be because a group of people really has a dream of a healthy planet, an inclusive society, uh, resilient communities and dignified livelihoods. And we realized early on that actually there is um, a problem that we want to address like most, <laughs> most organizations. And that is specifically focusing on untapped grassroots innovation, innovations, uh, change makers and um, operating in silos. So there's a big disconnect with so many organizations and great social entrepreneurs, chefs, um, agriculture um, representatives that are working with this powerful tool of food, but they're working in silos. They're not actually connected. They're not collaborating. And so that combined with the underrepresented community voices and unequitable food systems, as we just looked at through the context setting of Johanna, that's what motivated us to create the social gastronomy movement. Actually, the vision originally um, it came up through Chef David Hertz, um, that is the founder of Gastromotiva, one of the social gastronomy organizations that are part of a network and was the incubating board as well of the movement. And eventually we, we brought everyone together um, in 2018 and um, kicked off this network that now is connecting, collaborating, creating partnerships towards this more inclusive and just food system. And um, today, this is just a little um, bit about our systems map that we have. You can go on the social gastronomy website and actually uh, jump into that platform. That's the um, social gastronomy map. And um, you can discover all these different innovations and um, social entrepreneurs, activists around the world that are doing amazing things um, using food as a tool for social change. Um, here, it's a static one, but you can again click into it and check it out like with the sustainable development goals that we mentioned before, or towards the target audience or towards the issues that the organization is trying to solve. So nowadays, we are a global network of more than 180 organizations and um, change makers. And everyone in the networks, be networks believes in the power of food to transform realities. And our recipe for change that we've um, co-created um, a while back is CCPs. What does that mean? So basically it starts with a connection, with a first C, the sense of belonging. So you meet other people that are doing amazing things. You can connect, you can exchange. Um, we have a lot of best practices to, um, to exchange. We had this amazing session led by Joy, who's in the room as well, um, with that, that were organizations that work with um, prisoner reintegration after their sentencing, 
where they were transformed through the power of food, through, through trainings and got job opportunities after. So we did a session this morning where three different organizations were just sharing their experiences and giving shining light on very local realities. So they connected through the social gastronomy movement. The map that you've seen, the annual summit that happens that I hope everyone can join in October on World Food Day, starting World Food Day really, uh, virtual gatherings, webinars, community brews where we just have a space to, to exchange. And then we, come, we move towards the collaboration. And we truly believe that the way that we collaborate is actually gonna inform um, the way our future will unfold. And so here we're entering the space of working together, not just connecting, but really working to go together towards a shared goal. And how do we do that? We have a platform, an online platform, where we have working groups, um, that one that we mentioned where Johanna was one of the um, founding members as well of the education network. Um, and there are many other working groups that exist or can exist in the future, depending on your motivation as well. Uh, Roundtables, it's a methodology that we designed to set the context and then move into action together. And the Social Gastronomy Collective Fund as well, that um, came to be with COVID last year. And then we move towards the partnerships. The partnerships is really sharing responsibility towards systems change. And this is where we've introduced and developed a framework and a program, which is called the Collective Impact Program. So we can really go from collective intelligence to collective impact, because Honestly, I mean, we're not going to reach the sustainable development goals if we don't start collaborating, creating these partnerships together. Um, some of the core projects I've already mentioned, um, which are the SGM events, the summit, the collective fund, and the collective impact program. And now, the most exciting part of our presentation, actually, because now you've heard about the concept, you've heard about the context setting, and um, what the social gastronomy movement is. But the most important part is what are social gastronomy organizations and activists actually doing? So this is where our case studies, Joanna and I selected a few case studies that should represent um, some of the work being done, there's much more, but these were good case studies that really show that social gastronomy acts across the food cycle. So it really goes um, from supporting farmers up until the food waste recovery process of it. So I'm going to kick us off with a um, special project from the Philippines, which really works with farmers. And um, it was founded by uh, chief farmer, <laughs> Sherry. She um, was from a farming family, actually, and saw that the absurdness was happening with farmers, those that are producing and feeding the world, actually, um, are going hungry themselves. And so that's where she actually started to to dedicate her life to champion and create a new narrative for agriculture. She created the one island economy model, um, which is focused on capacity building. She has a capacity building framework um, where they work really with um, farmers um, whoop, through, I'm sorry for the mistakes, <laughs> through values formation. Um, they skill farmers through technical training, as well as empower farmers through financial literacy, because all of these elements are, um, are oftentimes not part of a farmer community. She developed farm schools actually. And one important element is she brings youth back into agriculture and started agriculture and youth programs um, towards entrepreneurship as well, workshops, and all of that really to make farming sexy again. So giving it this new narrative because a lot of young people are actually moving away from farming and it's such a crucial industry. So. If you want to learn more, um, I do encourage you to go to Agrea's uh, website and check out the amazing work of Sherry. Johanna, to oh, you now. Thank you. Um, I wanted to point out this project. It's called the Life Project. Uh, the center piece here is a cookbook, but Life Project was something that was set up in Istanbul and Mersin, Turkey to bring together Syrian refugees with Turkish men and women in a entrepreneurship training effort. And it's a, it became a very successful three-year pilot of opening up an incubator kitchen where men and women from uh, Syria could mix with people from Turkey. Now, there was a linguistic barrier, we had translations, but one of the things that I think is an important lesson is that 
the food in Turkey and the food in Syria have many common roots. The Ottoman Empire was broad and crossed the whole of Central Asia through Europe. And so people could connect, even if they didn't speak the language, over the similar foods. And the result was many new entrepreneurs were spawned out of this project. And the program is still going on on a uh, basis where people are paying for courses. But for the first three years, the courses were offered free. We had ch child care help uh, in the both centers, one in Istanbul and one in Mersin, which is in the southeast of Turkey, close to the Syrian border. Uh, so it shows, once again, a way through social gastronomy to address the current challenges we have globally, and that is refugees coming out of a war. And the woman you see on the right side of your screen, she was a refugee from Yemen. The man on the top left was a Turkish entrepreneur who was growing different types of uh, tea, uh, there were people doing cheeses, but the interesting part is it was a very useful way to bring people together over common ground, which was food. Next slide. Brilliant. Getting there, getting there. I was reading all the comments as well. <laughs> oh. There we go. Okay, gusto. So let's go to Bolivia. And I want to point out because uh, we have an absolutely amazing social gastronomy organization from Morocco, as Nora was um, writing in the chat as well, that's part of a class. But we specifically didn't choose your project to present here right now, Amal, um, because nobody person than you to share it. So maybe when we have our last section of QA and discussion, you can share life with your classmates um, around your project. So I just wanted to point that out because you have um, a little star in your class there as well. Um, so we're going to Bolivia and really the focus. So we heard about the refugee integration element and connecting over food. So there is a part that's extremely important and actually part of, of my background it, as I was co-leading Gastromotiva that we mentioned before in Brazil. And it's about job creation. So really creating the economic development. And Gusto is a really interesting concept. Um, really encourage everyone to check out even more. They have a beautiful documentary as well. But what Klaus Mayer, that is really an icon in, um, in advancing as well the <laughs> food world and created a great manifesto that Johanna maybe can afterward talk to a little bit as well, the Nordics manifesto. So here they as well, um, Klaus made a manifesto of a new Bolivian uh, cuisine, trying to, to shift the way that we look at cuisine in Bolivia. Um, and so he created Gusto, where Camila and Michelangelo actually opened the restaurant. It's a fine dining restaurant using all local ingredients, absolutely brilliant. And at the same time, they created vocational education training centers. Nowadays, uh, Manca operates actually in 15 schools across Bolivia, Colombia, uh, and Guatemala. And basically it's about training people in order to find a job in the industry. The restaurant industry is one of the most blooming industries towards job creation. There are opportunities and you can start at any level and um, find this, this moment to just you know, grow your career. And so this is like a brilliant model of training young people um, that are looking for an opportunity uh, towards becoming active in the restaurant industry, really trying to find their true vocation. And there is a little video that I wanted to share. It was created actually for one of our UN Food System Summit's dialogues, telling the story of one of these students. So um, let's hope the video works and I'll share it right here with you. No, it did not work yet. <laughs> Give us a second to try to, ooh, it takes us to YouTube. Okay, but this should work. All right, let me know if it works. Tengo 28 años y vivo en la zona de Chini, en la ciudad de La Paz. Así en la provincia de Muñecas, comunidad compañía, la gente vive básicamente trabajando en tierra, en producción de maíz, haba, papa. Mis padres deciden venirse a la ciudad, obviamente con la oportunidad. I was informed that you can't see the video, is that correct? Yes, we can't no, see it. No, we can't see it. Oh, no. 
Okay, so you know what? I think the YouTube video is going to be hard um, to show, but I will share afterward the link for everyone to watch this great video. It's actually on our um, website of the Social Gastronomy Movement. So you can check it out um, there as well afterward. And there are a few other brilliant videos of those resilience heroes, actually. So I'll, I'll make sure to share every, with everyone in the class the link afterward. Well, actually, Joy is in the room, so she can share the link to our website as well there. Um, so let's move to the next um, to the next slide for Johanna. Oh, now would this work? Tengo 28 años y vivo en Natochini, en la ciudad de La Paz. Nací en la provincia de Muñecas, comunidad compañía. La gente vive básicamente trabajando en tierra, en producción de maíz, haba, papa. Mis padres deciden venirse a la ciudad, obviamente con la Okay, not working. I thought that we got it. Johanna, I'm passing on to you if this light moves. There we go. Okay, it's not, the slide didn't move, Nikki. It moved for me, that's really strange. Oh, well, I, what is, um, I don't see, what I see on the screen, I can open my... Um, I can open my, let me go into the background. You won't see me, but I don't want to get off here. We have moved here to COVID response, uh, Marseille McDonald's project. Oh, um, well, Ruba, can you just I, confirm that you can see the slides or? Uh, no, I can still see the Gusto restaurant uh, slide. It's frozen. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can try to stop sharing and then share again. Right. Okay. Yeah. But Johanna, go ahead if you want already. I'll figure out the slides to accompany. <laughs> sure. Well, we had a real tough time. Ah, oh, there it is. It's it's just got frozen. I, there are so many choices that we could have made because one of the phenomena of COVID is the way people responded. But I found this story uh, about a group in Marseille that took over the McDonald's. This was a McDonald's restaurant which you know has a dark history in France as there's been much protest about fast food, but this one was not being operated after COVID. And a group of citizens, and this is gastro diplomacy, took it over and made it a feeding center because it has an industrial kitchen. So on the left, you see they painted McDonald's pink and blue, which I think is quite pretty actually with the McDonald's logo. And then on the right, you see the coordinator of this project with people from the city and there are lots of pictures on it I can put in the chat the link to this story which appeared in the uh, Washington Post but it was a very moving story about the citizens of Marseille taking over the McDonald's during a pandemic and saying we're not going to let this industrial kitchen go to waste we're going to help feed people um, I wanted to also comment that Angusta was uh, just a wonderful example of social gastronomy. Uh, but in Peru as well, uh, the other famous chef in Peru, uh, Gaston, built a similar set of schools which are going very strong with the same objectives that Gusto did in Bolivia, but really very interesting. Um, so I think we our, ch our challenge was finding enough examples. We didn't have to have that challenge. Do you want to move it on, Nikki? See if it'll move. Yes. Can you oh. see? Screen? Yeah, no, I can see. It's moved for me. But... Perfect. So then I can move on to the next case. So we did mention, and there was some excitement before of, um, Gastromotiva. I'm not going to talk about the um, job training element of it, um, as it's similar as well to, to the Gusto model. However, Gastromotiva was as well amazing at reinventing itself as COVID hit Brazil. So pre-COVID, uh, the focus was really vocational training, entrepreneurs classes, food waste um, reduction and education. And as COVID hit, um, Gastromotiva couldn't operate the restaurant school, Refetorio Gastromotiva anymore, neither um, could they continue doing the vocational trainings. And so actually coming, but innovation coming from one of the students or former students, so graduates of Gastromotiva, the idea of a solidarity kitchen emerged. So what was a solidarity kitchen? The Solidary Kitchens is basically activating the network of graduates, which are above 5,000 graduates already by now, um, that are actually living 
in the poorer communities of, of different cities in Brazil, so in the favelas, as you would refer to in, um, in Brazil, and um, opening their own kitchens as solidarity kitchens. So saying, we've got the skills. If we get the food supply, we can serve our communities within the community. We don't need to leave because there are a lot of COVID response programs that cooked food and distributed on the spot and people had to go get it, which is also exposure to the virus. And so um, I thought this was a very neat example to bring because within very short time, Gastromotiva mobilized all of its students and started building these kitchens. So by now, 51 kitchens have been um, have been opened. Almost 500,000 meals have been um, have been distributed, and 29 entrepreneurs were activated. So, what started now is a training program for those entrepreneurs to actually run their own kitchens, and it's supposed to become a social business model for each of. Um, these little kitchens where they become self-sustainable post-COVID as well, when we go past the emergency response. And um, I think what's beautiful is really this multiplier effect where those cooks become social agents inside of the communities. And um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, it's supposed to be a self-sustainable little model. And at the same time, these kitchens can serve as mini community development centers for encounter, for learning, for sharing. Um, I'm gonna give it one more try with the videos. <laughs> Let's see if it works now. Please, Duruba, speak up. I'll keep a chat as well active here in case it doesn't work. But let's try because we have a beautiful video from Rio. Gastromotiva ela nasceu por dois propósitos. Um, para democratizar o ensino da gastronomia, porque quem tem formação tem liberdade, tem autonomia. Ela nasceu também para ir além do cozinheiro, para apoiar empreendedores. Uma grande parcela da população brasileira empreende por necessidade, são criativos. Hoje eu estou aqui nesse comando da Cozinha Solidária, estou cercado de profissionais maravilhosos, que são a base desse projeto que eu vi, que eu não estou fazendo isso aqui sozinho. É uma equipe que junto, eu agradeço imensamente a eles. A parceria dos orgânicos da Fátima, com a Gastromotiva e as Cozinhas Sociais, a gente está passando a lista do que a gente tem de excedente e eles fazem o pedido e a gente entrega lá. Aqui também em função do nosso banco de alimentos, é aqui que a gente separa os kits dos insumos que vão ser direcionados para as cozinhas solidárias. O que mudou com a, essa oportunidade da gastromotiva de mostrar a maravilha de você aproveitar tudo, da raiz à cura. Acho que o principal desafio é o acesso aos alimentos, principalmente aos alimentos saudáveis. O impacto que a, que a cozinha solidária causa é uma coisa gigantesca, porque aqui de a 50 metros tem alguém passando fome. Acho que a partir do momento que tu cozinha e dá uma roupa de puta pra alguém que tá na rua, que tu olha no olho da pessoa e vê a fome na cara dela, a partir do momento que tu vê isso uma vez, tu não consegue deixar de ver mais isso. Comida saudável é aquela comida que leva felicidade, que leva conforto, que faz a pessoa se sentir humana. E além do alimento, é um olhar diferente. Eles saberem que eles são pessoas, que eles existem e que a vida deles pode transformar, a comida transforma. Então você tem que entender que cada lugar tem a sua própria identidade, peculiaridade, mas a cozinha solidária, ela chega para somar o cozinheiro solidário, ele é primeiro um articulador. É, o papel do cozinheiro solidário na comunidade é o quê? Eu acho que é o exemplo. E essa consciência passando para os outros moradores, para as pessoas que estão em torno, eu acho que vai enriquecer muito mais a comunidade. <risos> Muitas pessoas dessa comunidade necessitam de um alimento deles, porque as pessoas aqui passam fome. A minha expectativa é que o projeto cresça e que em cada região do Rio tenha um cozinha solidária fixa. Eu sonho com ela desse jeito, uma cozinha motivacional, onde eu também possa ensinar, mostrar para eles que a gente pode usar o alimento como moeda de troca e de transformação da vida das pessoas. Ser cozinheiro social é ser um agente de transformação local.
not again. <laughs> oh, wait. Great. I'm so happy the video worked because I think there's nothing better than seeing both realities, these local realities as well. Although the video was in, in Portuguese, look what's subtitled. Um, I think it should have given a really good idea of what um, David and the team created during in response of COVID. And now it switched around the entire model of gastromotiva, taking it to another level. And I think that's what social entrepreneurship is all about as well, that reinvention in face of, um, of its externalities. Johanna. So I think to we're continuing along that line because in addition to these uh, training of gourmet level chefs and high class chefs for fancy food, uh, Peru suffers, continues to suffer a tremendous impact of pandemic and it it has a large poor population outside of the on the outskirts of the city of Lima but also all through the country so on the one hand Peru was a country that had one of the highest growth growth rates in the world and particularly in Latin America mainly because of its strong mineral deposits uh, but oh yes comunes which means a communal uh, pots or pans was a program that was set up to help feed people who lost their jobs during the pandemic. The service industries completely were stopped. And this is a map on the right side of where these projects were set up in and around the city of Lima and then outside of Lima. So like the Solidarity Kitchen program in Brazil, this has become a major movement. It's supported by the Catholic Church, by the Evangelical Church, by local citizens, by contributions. And it's an enormously important source of feeding people and is continuing. So yes, this is social gastronomy in action using food as a means for survival and social change and also bringing communities together, which we'll talk about as we conclude what you can do. Joanna, it stays with you for the next two. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, World Central Kitchen, I'm sure you've all heard about because everybody has heard about so Jose Andres, uh, the Spanish chef who established World Central Kitchen in 2010, but actually became much more visible after the uh, terrible hurricane, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, and activated his network of chefs to start feeding people when governmental responses were just not there. I just learned today, and I was sharing with Nikki, that World Central Kitchen, and Jose Andres especially, has received $100 million from Jeff Bezos, the billionaire who just went up into space for his work in food and gastronomy. But what's fascinating is that although they work in areas with natural and man-made disasters, they have not worked in conflict zones, but they have been doing something which many government programs don't do. And that is bringing communities together in times of crisis to work. And they bring in volunteers, but they also use the local community and try and work with people who are there, try to accommodate this food feeding needs, making food that's appropriate for the area. So um, he is a great humanitarian and his team has really help to elevate the work that they're doing. During the pandemic, just to let you know, in the United States, they received so much money that they became a central banker for smaller restaurants who then opened their doors and started using their kitchens for feeding centers and food preparation. So next slide. And then I had suggested we put in food, sweet food and the refugee festival because I first met this group of uh, very, very bright French social entrepreneurs when they started in 2015, when the refugee crisis started in Europe. Uh, the people who founded this group did something which I think is really needed and I hope will come to a discussion at the World Food Summit. They brought in the private sector because in France, there was a tremendous backlash against refugees they did not like the fact that so many people were coming into their country. And these courageous young people decided to set up refugee food festivals, first in the south of France near Montpellier, uh, but then also in other areas. Now this food, sweet food and refugee food festival takes place all over Europe. 
They did come to New York for the, one of the UN General Assemblies. And what they have done successfully has integrated the social entrepreneurship components with a greater understanding of refugees. And you know, one of the things we know is when you leave home and you can't bring anything except what's in your mind, refugee food becomes a very important way to connect back with the memories and the tastes of your home. So this is a remarkable set of individuals that continues and could be duplicated around the world. Next slide, I think is you, Nikki, if I'm not mistaken. All right. So it was like Joanna said, really hard to select the cases. Um, and there again, you can just enter the map and see many, many more inspiring stories of how people are using food for social good, for social change to respond to some of these issues, um, like Johanna was saying. And one issue we've heard about um, in the context setting moment was food waste. And so that's how actually Food for Soul was born because Chef Massimo Boutura uh, was invited in 2015 to be the chef of honor. It was the expo in Milano. And he was invited to, to, do, uh, to be the chef of the day for the expo. And he said he refused. He got various invitations and he basically refused and said, no, 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 no. We cannot you know, talk of a future um, food, future food. Um, if we don't actually address the issues now and serve those in need. And so that's where the refetorio, the very first uh, refetorio came to be, which basically is a place, a physical space that's designed as a community hub to inspire and empower human potential, as they would put it. It is a beautiful space that was oftentimes abandoned, abandoned a space that belonged to the city, and it gets restored into its full potential and full beauty. Um, so Massimo actually works in Food for Soul with, with artists and architects to restore these, um, these buildings and create a very different kind of soup kitchen. And um, basically, why does he combine the, the cultural element? There is a quote that I really like um, from Massimo's perspective, which is, culture brings knowledge. Knowledge leads to consciousness. And when we become conscious, we are one short step away from becoming socially responsible. So culture is key. This is why he puts so much emphasis in, in the art and the restoring of these buildings. And what else do we restore? What's the concept of um, refetorios? There is by now a big network across the globe where um, these soup kitchens, these very modern soup kitchens, basically recuperate food food that was being thrown away, food that um, supermarkets discarded and um, it gets delivered to the refetorios. And through the creativity of chefs, it becomes, um, well, you would put it into, be, it becomes upcycled, it becomes a new life cycle. It becomes something beautiful. So a second life, second opportunity. And basically these chefs and cooks uh, create beautiful dishes out of a food that was already discarded and um, going to the trash and give this new opportunity, serving those that, those that most need it. So obviously that depends on the local reality, wherever the refectorio is built. So actually, <laughs> I know a lot about the project because I was part of the launch in Brazil, uh, the Refetorio Gastromotiva, that we launched in 2016. And I can only say it's just about one of the things we um, said about the dream of the social gastronomy movement is dignified lives and resilient communities. And dignified life starts with um, how we eat food. Like we, we think of you are what you eat, but what are you if you don't eat? Or what are you if you eat trash, if you eat other people's um, food that's on the floor? So here the idea is really to transform this food, give it a second life cycle, and then serve it in dignity. So it's not just um, putting the food on a plate and you pick it up, but basically you always have volunteers that serve those in need. So homeless people, people that um, don't have access to a warm meal. So they sit around the table, they experience this entire service industry moment and get served these beautiful dishes. And it becomes this um, community moment for people. And it gives the spark of hope of hope when life can bring something good again. And so this is really a beautiful moment of bringing back that dignity uh, into people's life. And um, that's a little movement that's across the globe, as I mentioned again, so I do encourage um, to, to check out the project. I included a little video as well of Massimo. So I think it's good to listen to his words. I do hope that this one works because it is YouTube linked. Um, otherwise, again, I'll send the links afterward. Let's try this.
Yeah, that's not looking good. <laughs> Loading. I fixed it. There it is. Okay. okay, let me just click again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really isn't our technology day today. <laughs> Let me try one more time, and if it doesn't work, then we'll open up for our last part of the of the session. I think it really doesn't want to work today. But Nikki, we should put in. There was a movie about food for soul, the original yes. about uh, Massimo. And Fear I, of Life on Netflix. It's really right. beautiful, and I think that would be worth if anybody has a subscription or wants to see it shows a lot of the things that Nikki has just talked about. The, exactly, theater of life, thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, well, the video didn't work. Uh, so let's open it up to our last section. Um, and let me just pull up the slide again. I know, I'm really disappointed with technology today. All right, so now our question to you is, what can each of us do to address the free seas and beyond through social gastronomy? I will just, since we want to hear a little bit of a, a discussion moment here, so I'm um, going to take out the slide and, um, and hopefully loads of you can turn on your cameras to, um, to hear. I know the chat was really active um, before with some comments and um, as well comments about Africa, how social gastronomy in Africa. There is a social gastronomy chef in, in Ghana. Um, that's active. However, we don't have very much strong presence. So I would encourage if anyone knows of amazing um, entrepreneurs or organizations um, on the African continent, we would definitely love to hear from those cases as well. Yes. So maybe Ruba, do you have questions in the chat that you've gathered? Yes, we have. We have a couple of questions in the chat. I can go through them. Um, Okay, so first we had a question, I think it was from Bernard about Africa. Bernard, would you like to ask your question? Okay, I think he's not here. Okay, so- um, I'd he appreciate if you did it for me. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, so Bernard's question, let me see if I can find it. Um, what is gas the social gastronomy movement doing to reduce the lack of adequate foods in Africa? Go for it, Jonah. <laughs> I saw you speaking up. No, I, I think this is a very important question. As Nikki mentioned, we don't have a lot of contacts in Africa. I've seen there are groups in Cape Town and South Africa that are working. Uh, you, I think, have been, are you in Kenya, if I'm not mistaken? But yeah, I'm from Kenya. I'm from Kenya. So one of the things that we would very much welcome is if you know groups that are doing the things we describe, is one to let us know about them. And to, um, you know, certainly we know that there are groups in Morocco, which is North Africa. We know that there are groups in Tunisia. We know that there are groups uh, that are doing similar types of work. They just don't call themselves social gastronomy, which goes back to the original poll, which you couldn't see. But, you know, is that trying to get a terminology accepted for something you see is very important. So I think what we're asking today is, you know your communities better than we do, let them know what is available and how we can all connect and support one another. And I, um, I do want to, uh, two things on that as well. And thank you, Johanna, seconding everything you're saying. There are groups out there, but what social gastronomy is doing is just creating the term, shared terminology and creating this umbrella to be part of something together and actually drive, because together we're stronger and the voices get heard more strongly. Um, so there's the social entrepreneur and chef, uh, Elijah, who's actually um, the founder of Food for All Africa that, that you can find on the map. And now she disappeared. We did mention Morocco and uh, North Africa. So I would love to put Nora on the spot actually. 
<laughs> there she is. Was what happened? You had had the chance to hear about Nora's project, and I do know that we're live. So Nora, I, I think it'd be amazing to hear about uh, a mouth from from you directly as well. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'd like to. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Amel and then about our connection to social gastronomy movement and how uh, that all came together during the pandemic. Uh, Amel is a um, nonprofit organization in Marrakesh, Morocco, which I founded in 2012. Um, kind of as my response to, <laughs> you know, what can we do about <laughs> just the, the level of inequality that we see in the world and in, in our own communities. And the idea of ML is that it, it's a, um, it functions as a restaurant uh, open to the public. And at the same time in the kitchen, there are women that are training with chefs and they, um, <clears throat> they just, they get all the skills that they need in order to then get a job and, and work in the food industry. And so this has been going on since 2012. Uh, we've trained over 300 women. And uh, it's, it's just been a really beautiful thing of how sort of food and empowerment and community, like it's a really community space that's created, how that's all come together. Uh, of course, the pandemic um, <laughs> kind of brought a halt to everything we'd built and done. And, and at that point, um, like, there, like there was food insecurity in my community pretty much from day one. <clears throat> and so I had this intention, I was like, I just wanna reconvert everything we've done to now feeding people. And that was kind of my intention that I put out, hoping that the universe would send me back what, what was needed. And um, we started, uh, we did a massive like uh, distribution of both dry food and cooked meals. So cooked meals was for Uh, hospital workers, like people in the COVID hospitals, we just, we cooked and delivered thousands of <laughs> sandwiches, uh, plates of couscous um, uh, over the course of probably six months. And that is when the social gastronomy movement reached out to us. I think that was our first connection. And uh, they were, they had put together this really cool fund four organizations that were, uh, I think you called it pandemic heroes or something like this. So for organizations who were giving away food within their community. Um, and ML was one of the recipients of 10 uh, cash prizes, which was really great. It's, it's great when you're doing something good <laughs> and someone just comes and gives you cash and says, keep doing what you're doing. Um, instead of like jumping through all these hoops of writing grants and, and reports and all of that, that, that sucks away a lot of the energy. And um, so, yeah, that, that was part of the reason why we were able to continue giving the food away for so long. And as Nikki said, uh, one of the cool things about social gastronomy is just the connections that you make with other people. And so for me, like realizing that, you know, there are other people in other communities that I'd never heard about who were kind of um, passionate and driven by the same things that I was doing, uh, facing the same kind of challenges. Um, that was really, really cool. And I, I think for people <clears throat> who, work, um, who work at this intersection of you know, food and hunger and, and social inequality, like it's hard to keep motivated Uh, it's hard to find inspiration. And that's why like sometimes, <laughs> you know, when one of us is down, you know, you hear somebody else's story and it just, it gives you that, that lift that you need to keep going. And then another time you can be that for somebody else. Um, okay. Thank you, Nikki. You are amazing, Nora. And thank you. I think I'm going to invite Nora to all of our future <laughs> future presentations. <laughs> That was not rehearsed. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Nora. And thank you for the work you're doing. 
Ruba, back to you to coordinate us. <laughs> uh, so we had another question from Nick in the chat. who he was asking about the meaning of your logo. So the four circles in one big circle. Can you explain on that a bit? Ooh, I love our logo, I have to say. Uh, and you can actually like go deeper on it. I can give you like a quick overview. Um, there are a lot of meanings to it. Um, and in the last annual report from 2020, there's a whole section on it. So if you're interested in the whole design process, you can check that out. But basically, the rounds, it's all about being round, about circular. Um, and so if you look from the top, very different interpretations. I'm going to give like my interpretation, the things that I remember. We always remember the things that most resonate with us. But it's like a plate. It can be, first of all, it can be a table, a round table, where you have plates on it. So it's coming to the table. Um, the round is obviously everything around circular. And then um, if we look at, I mean, we saw the presentation versus again, these waves as well. And so the rounds represent the ripple effect as well. So you know, when you throw a stone into the water, where it hits, it creates ripple effects. And that's exactly what um, we're trying to do at the social gastronomy movement, creating these ripple effects and creating this movement. So very different meanings in the logo, but that's a little bit some of the ideas behind it as it was created. Aruba, you are on mute, if ever. <laughs> I'm also reading another question actually from, uh, from Nick. Uh, he said that there is absolutely a stone of everything, giant, giant burgers, pizzas, extra cheese and butter and everything. And he is thinking that this is so un unnecessary and wasteful on so many levels. So he just said this in the, in the chat. Well, in addition to giant and the things we're talking about, we've been talking about hunger for the last hour, but there's also the, a pandemic of obesity which is killing people. And part of that is because of the lack of nutritious food, because of the lack of portion controls, because there is very little regard for what we consume. And particularly in communities that don't have a lot of resources, uh, this is I think an obligation of the corporate world, which has been stuffing people with chips and sodas filled with sugar. Uh, and I heard a very sad story from one of our members at, at uh, SGM in Guatemala. She was going around doing a nutrition survey and found a young mother feeding her baby a soft drink, a Coca-Cola in a bottle. And she couldn't imagine why the woman was doing this. And she asked her, she said, well, I wanna serve my child the things that rich people can have. Uh, she doesn't need milk. So it's also nutrition education that is really lacking. And maybe Nikki, that's something for us to put on our agenda in our education work, is how do we combine nutrition education so people have access to safe and nutritious food, but also have access to information about why people become obese? Uh, because it's, it's truly one of the killers in the world that we don't realize exists, and it's a silent killer. Uh, yeah, and I think in, in on that being said, it's one of the things we, um, as the social astronomy movement, hosted six um, uh, UN Food System Summit dialogues, um, which were which is a tool of including different voices towards the summit that Johanna mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And one of the under art, like one of the themes that arched over all of the different um, themes of the dialogues we did was education. So I think it's as well, you know, like it's extremely important because education comes on so many levels. And, and actually based on that finding, um, our summit that's happening in October that I was mentioning, um, there's a run up to the summit now already where different local communities, actually that's a really cool thing for everyone here to get involved in. So we'll share some information of that as well. Um, but basically we're, uh, we wanna put the theme of education as well as the overall running theme. And um, then I'll invite everyone to host a universal plate in very local communities as well. I think Joe, you can go ahead and share all of that information in the chat. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think education is definitely one of these like common determinators between all these issue areas. All right, thank you. And then we had a question from Laura who was inspired uh, with the Migrant Kitchen Project and she would love to hear more about it. 
Oh. Johanna, I'll pass this one to you. You have a one bread brought migrant kitchen to the network. <laughs> oh, well, Migrant Kitchen is actually a very interesting group in New York. Um, and it was started by a young man who I met through his own interest in helping to support refugee kitchens before that. But during the pandemic, Migrant Kitchen actually decided that nobody was feeding hospital workers in New York City. And so they took their kitchen, which had been actually used to offer lunches at some of these uh, communal workplaces and began to start making meals for hospital workers. And then um, during the Ramadan, because one of the owners, a friend of mine is a Muslim, decided that there was no access to food for poor people in the Muslim community to get out. So he started making halal uh, iftar dinners for people. And there was just a lot of good work going on. But now he, this young man, his name is Nas Jabber and his partner are opening up a larger kitchen. I'm, in fact, I'm supposed to go up and see it next week. And they're trying to be contractors with the schools in New York who lost a lot of their service personnel. So there is opportunity out of crisis everywhere that we know about. And I think Migrant Kitchen is one example of that. All right, and then there was one more question also from Bernard in the chat. Uh, he was asking about the terminology uh, that you used, which is a power of food, the power of food to create reality. And so he wants to, uh, maybe if we can provide more information about that. And he was asking overall how he can be part of the social gastronomy movement. Uh, well, first of all, <laughs> I invite everyone to be part of, because we need loads of climate and food shapers. I think there's not, the important thing to understand, which is important for us as well, that the food system is so complex, the food systems, because I think there are so many parallel elements to it as well, is so complex. We cannot just have one group or one person working on these issues. And so therefore, like the CCPs, the Connection, Collaboration and Partnerships came to be, right? And um, our mission is, well, to engage people in the food systems to collaborate towards social change. And so, um, first of all, our group is doing that part, but then the Future Food Institute is another network. So we're all interconnected. And I think that's the beauty. I see it like a universe. It's like these star constellations and we're one of these constellations within. So I definitely would encourage anyone that felt inspired, that is doing amazing stuff, because we've talked about examples from um, around the world, but there might be more Nordas in the room as well that are already doing things, or I am pretty confident most of you are going to come out and do things if you don't do already uh, after the boot camp. So, so yeah, definitely come join us. If you um, go on the website, there's a section on become a member. You can look at the map already that I mentioned a few times and um, subscribe. You fill out a quick survey and then actually um, our team is going to get in touch for an onboarding session and with different tools and possibilities of engagement, whatever inspires you in that context, who to connect to, who to collaborate with, and maybe to create partnerships together. And for food transforms um, realities. So um, I think, well, there are many meanings to that. I think actually, Joy, if you want to unmute afterward and say a few words, because as we were bringing that term to life um, last year, it, um, it emerged from, from joy the final terminology. But basically it's looking at um, these realities that we're all living. These realities are very local. And so um, as well our personal realities. And so how can, if we, for example, do one of these courses, we've talked about trainings in, in the examples. So if I go in as a, stu um, as a, well, as a young, young person in the favelas in Brazil, and I get accepted to the gastromotiva course, my reality was very local within the no perspective. My parents kept on telling me that I had no opportunities. I'm, I'm, I'm oftentimes not worth anything. Stop trying, just, you know, keep doing what you're doing, you know, the survival. So you st stop believing, you start believing in possibility. And so for this court, you started, first of all, to work in the kitchen, to discover ingredients, to work with others, because kitchens is that. Kitchens is working in teams together. And all of a sudden your reality changes. So that's how food can transform reality. So this is just one of the examples because there are different examples around that. But for me, that is like a beautiful story of someone that was living a certain reality, got this opportunity to go through a, a training and working with food in the kitchens, which is a educational center and transform their realities. 
and yeah, Joy took my 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 throw at her, <laughs> just like Nora. Of course, I, I wouldn't be able to miss <laughs> this. I'm I'm so happy, so thankful to be here. I think this is an amazing space, and I just wanted to share about this because it was an idea that flowed between the whole team, and I suggested it. Why are we here? It's because we believe in the power of food to transform realities. And that came so strong for me because that's what happened to me. I was a student at the first class of Gastromochiva here in my city. I went through a lot of different restaurants. I come from a family that has absolutely no means. I am the first one to speak a second, third, and fourth language and graduating now from college. And I think that it all came from not only going through the course in Gastromochiva, but seeing that it's possible, hearing that there are other people that are making it. And I think that where gastronomy enters, and it's funny enough that we had a session about this this morning, which was putting hope on the menu. So how can workforce reintegration programs, how can job training, how can nutrition education actually give second chances to people? It doesn't matter if you were in prison or if you just never had any opportunities in your life, but gastronomy and food brings those kinds of opportunities. So that's why we believe that food is the only thing that can change and transform our realities. Thank you. Thank so, you, Joy. Ruba, how much time do we have left? We have around uh, five minutes. Okay. So maybe be, there are a couple of questions I saw in the chat. Would it be helpful for us to sort of respond to them? You know, maybe you can read them off so Nikki and I can be responsive to everybody who had something. Uh, yes, I went through basically all the questions in the chat. The questions I was asking were in the chat. So uh, now we have some comments, basically just positive comments from everyone who was very inspired and also I would love I would like to open the floor to uh, others who have not written in the chat maybe they have questions that they want to ask please feel free to unmute yourself we still have some time for a couple of questions if you'd like well great Someone is writing, the concept is needed in Africa. And I think, honestly, <laughs> beyond the social gastronomy movement, I do think that social gastronomy is needed around the world. Because <laughs> um, as Joy said, it does transform realities and it's, it's a very powerful tool. And we, we sit around the table every day in this group, right? We think about food, we, we work with food and, and often we don't, we underestimate this power that it actually has. So discovering that power and using it for social good, because it can be used for negative things as well. Like food started worse as well, but food finished worse as well. And so I think uh, looking at this power and seeing the two sides of a coin as well with caution is important, but yeah, definitely I see it's needed everywhere. <laughs> And I think there's also Bernard who's asking if you have any e-courses, if you offer any e-courses. Not yet. Let's do it. <laughs> well, we'll do it, Bernard, if you want. We'll do it in Kenya. Uh, I think one thing that's really interesting and important as we go towards the UN Food Summit, and you're all there, is that it's the power of communities that will make change. I mean, at the end of the day, the Food Summit will organize and have action tracks. And I think you should take a look at those X action tracks and see which one you would like to spend some time on in your community, because that is how you, as my Swedish diplomat friend says, you make peace with nature. We can't forget that climate and food are totally related and that this pandemic has only underscored that problem. Uh, so it's really up to you more than any of us. I mean, Nikki and I can talk. Joy can do the great communication from Gospel Motiva and through uh, the movement. But it's people that make differences. And I want to put a plug in for that because you're sitting here today. It's maybe your dinner time where you are. And doing this is a really indication that you're devoted to making change in this world. 
I think we're perfect final words. <laughs> and Thank you can you. always reach out to us if you have any questions like Joy, um, Joy mentioned as well. We do have a podcast on, actually Laura mentioned, I think, uh, but we have podcasts on Spotify and on, um, on YouTube that are telling those stories. Last year's Garvin, Social Gastronomy Garvin, the summit couldn't be in person. So we took it online and there were over... I don't even know, 30 um, sessions that were created by our community, sharing the knowledge, sharing the stories. So um, that's all available on YouTube. So if there's a topic that um, excites you, you can go to YouTube and as well check those out. But I, I second Joanna on everything she's saying, like now the dialogues have happened. So how do we move from dialogue to action? And the action tracks are a perfect guide to start acting. Yeah, maybe we'll do prove a, a, an event on action tracks after the summit. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, I would like to say also that uh, your talk was very inspiring to whoever uh, is now sitting in their community or their home, as Laura was saying, that maybe sometimes you're not aware that someone at the same place where you are in a different world or a different country is doing exactly what you want to do. So it's inspiring for people who feel that they might not have an effect on the community, but in fact, a very small act can go a very long way. So I think this is something that we can take also from this presentation and that everyone can take as well. So uh, thank you so much for being here. If no one has any more questions, I would like to uh, thank you both so much for this inspiring session. And of course, we will share your uh, contacts with everyone who would, would like to reach out to you or keep in touch after the boot camp. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Nicola and Johanna for, um, for your time and for this inspiring presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rubia. <laughs> thank, thank you, Rubia. Thank you, um, everyone, and Lauren for, for the support. And Julia, thank you for the invitation, for having us, and um, also the, the alliance that we've built over the months with uh, Future Food Institute and SDM. Great. Well, have a great evening, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very